Well, we finished the book of Ruth. And now we are going to go back into our study of the book of Luke. So, correspondingly, would you turn with me to the book of Matthew? Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. The words of Jesus, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you as desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 21. That's what it immediately transpired just before this text. Verse 5, Luke 21. And while some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another, which will not be torn down. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we are going to see the, the goodness and the severity of God. We are going to see how uncompromising you are with your holiness of those who have the word of God in their lips. And we're going to see also how you are very, very faithful to your word. And eventually in this study we're going to see your enormous, enormous outpouring of grace and mercy on people who do not deserve it. So Lord, we pray that you would attend our understanding of this passage, help us to grasp it, help us to then make the appropriate applications for your glory. For We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, for the last few weeks, I don't know if this has been your um, idea or this has been your confession, but I've had a wonderful time studying this really great book, the book of Luke. No, the book of uh, Ruth. What a great book. Um, for those of you who weren't very familiar with it before, I hope now that you have it in your back pocket and, you, and you, there's a sense of wonder about the, the great book of Ruth. As Boaz observed, to take some highlights, Ruth had come to a land that was foreign to her, that she was an alien to and an enemy of, as things stood naturally. She left her home, family, and comforts to seek refuge under the wings of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And in a matter of weeks, Ruth more specifically asked that she could be under the wings of protection, guardianship, provision of Boaz as her Goel, as her kinsman redeemer. Boy, what a, what a great book. I loved preaching through that. And what a wonderful picture of the coming kinsman redeemer who would deliberately superintend one particularly family line to include Gentiles under the curse of God, persons with really sketchy backgrounds, family embarrassments, failures, people deserving to receive capital punishment, and just flat-out sinners 
and then affect his own incarnation into that family. Or, as Paul would say to the folks in Corinth, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. And then that beautiful, beautiful picture, we need to, sentence we need to grab onto. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. One more time. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that have to do with Luke? What does that have to do with anything we're studying now? Well, more perhaps than you would suspect. Jesus came, and as he came in the triumphal entry, they were going, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, save us now. They were rehearsing the words of Scripture. They were rehearsing the song that was traditional to be singing right at that moment. But they were also directing it to Christ and saying, Hoshiana, Lord, save us now. Would you redeem us? Save us. They were calling on, wittingly or unwittingly, a goel a kinsman redeemer. And Jesus came, and as he, as he came in, the crowds were chanting and joyful, and, and Jesus wept. Oh, if only you guys would recognize the day of your visitation. Well, Jesus came and presented himself first as the kinsman redeemer of Israel, and particularly of his city, the city that represented his name to the world, Jerusalem. But he came into his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. As a conclusion to his last day of public teaching and reasoning, he gave a scalding pronouncement of damning judgment on the leaders of Judaism in Matthew chapter 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Who warned you that you would escape the fires of hell? Wow. That event happens. He did the thing with the cursing of the fig tree. He watches for a moment as he sat down. He watches for a moment as a widow gives her last two cents. Her last two cents. As a study in the greedy, heartless teaching of those leaders. And then he issues this pronouncement. The one that we just looked at in Matthew chapter 23. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I'm in Matthew 23, 37, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. That's been the modus operandi of Jerusalem for literally centuries kills the prophet, stones those that are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. What does he mean by that? I wanted to gather them together the way a hen gathers her chicks, look at that phrase, under her wings, and you were unwilling. He says, and the concept goes all the way back to Luke, or Ruth, pardon me, I wanted to 
put my wings of protection and provision and guardianship over you. And you wouldn't. You wouldn't have it. You would not have it. And then look. Behold your house. Hold there for a minute. What do you mean your house? The day before, this is Wednesday, on Tuesday, he came into the temple and saw the kind of abuse that was going on there where the, the priestly class had turned the, the, the temple area into a place where people were getting ripped off. They were paying literally ten, uh, ten times the amount of the commercial value of the stuff that they were getting. And they were getting their own goods stolen from them. And that was just, that was just part of the social fabric. And people were, more importantly, being taught the wrong way. People who, if they listened to the teaching that was going on, would be made twofold more children of hell than the teachers. But on that day, Tuesday, he said, My house. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. My house. One day later. Your house. It's an incredible signal. I'm done. I am abandoning ownership. Your house. Your house. And it's your house is being left to you desolate. Left to you desolate. Well, the world is full of words. Why does he use the word desolate? Well, some would be tempted to say, well, I don't know, like, to me, the word desolate means fill in the blank. And charming, that's interesting, but really not important sorry, not in an ultimate sense in determining what the passage means. When he chooses a word, your house is to be left desolate, he's, he's using a term that should trigger a fountain, a flood of memory of Scripture that they would or should be familiar with. Your house is being left desolate. Why did Jesus choose that word? I believe if you're to understand this passage, you need to know what the rest of the hearers and the disciples knew or should have known. You need, I believe, to have at least the same background of that word that the Jews of that day would have had. That pronouncement should have frozen their blood. And so, now one of my teaching, teaching, preaching principles that I try and operate by, never skip an opportunity to teach an Old Testament passage, the, verb we are, the verse we are studying today is referencing. And that isn't always easy. We were in the book of Ruth and, and I end up having to study a guy like Perez. Well, that was not super comfortable. But this time, he uses a term that should flood their minds with significance. And um, it's a huge concept that's, for example, referenced over 40 times in one book. But over and over again in the major and minor prophets, and its meaning is universal. Its meaning is static and consistent. What does your house as being left desolate mean? Well, we could go several places, but one place for an answer is a book called Ezekiel. It's an entire book. Gives the concept of your house is left desolate. Ezekiel. So today, you didn't realize you were going to do this, but we're going to do a short course on the book of Ezekiel. Ready for that? So let's go there. Ezekiel chapter 1.
Ezekiel chapter 1. He gives the time frame. It came about in the 30th year, just so you understand, it is his 30th year. Ezekiel is 30 years old and he's begun his priestly ministry, even though he's a long way from home in Babylon. On the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Chebar among the exiles, he's off in Babylon. He's been carried off. He's about the same age as Daniel, who was carried off. So he's of that tribe. There, what had happened is, in 605, Jerusalem was considered too important, too well defended, to ever fall. And God surely wouldn't let that ever happen to Jerusalem, and it fell. And, and so... So many of the, um, they, they did a raid on the gold, and they did a raid on the people. They killed a whole bunch of the nobles, and they grabbed the nobles' kids and took them back to Babylon to kind of indoctrinate them so he could send them back to their home being Babylonian and kind of do their rule, do their um, administration as Babylonians with the right background. So that's what's happened here. He's one of them. He's along the river Chebar among the exiles. The heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the 50th of the month, in the fifth year of Jehoiakim's exile, we are at year 597. This is eight years after they were taken from Jerusalem. He in particular was. So, he's in that year. The word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel, the priest, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chabar, and there the hand of the Lord came upon him. And then the next part of this, people have looked at this and they're going, okay, so this is, this is common fare for prophecy. It's just, it's just uh, a description that nobody can get their arms around, get their hands around it. Just, and, and some people have described this as just sort of a childish meandering. And, you know, others who are even less tolerant of the Word of God say uh, Ezekiel must have been on a bad trip. But he describes something here, and you know something? It's not really all that hard to understand. So we're going to describe something here, and kids, if you're listening along, I trust you are, uh, I will accept artwork on this. If you go through this, and you can ask your dad all kinds of questions about what in the world is this going on, then I will accept some artwork, and some of the best artwork I will display on my refrigerator, okay? Some of the poorer stuff I will display on Steve's refrigerator. But anyway, we're, we're going to... Uh, so there, there's some point to this, but read. And as I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it, and in its midst something like the glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings. And by the way, when they say living beings, we go, okay, well, we don't know what that is. In any other case, this would be translated animals. Animals. Hmm. So they looked like animals. And this was their appearance. They had human form and their animals. What in the world? Well, hold, hold the phone. Each of them had four faces and four wings. The legs were straight. Their feet were like a calf's foot and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on their four sides were human hands. As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. And as for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. I don't know about you. I don't want to meet this guy. Um, that would sort of... Well, and that is the universal response when people meet an angel. They, they don't go, oh, man, I don't know. Is that an angel? No, they just kind of fall down like they're dead and go, 
dude, don't kill me, right? All right. So, such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two covering, touching one another and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. And they would go without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright and the lightning and flashing from the fire. And the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. So what you have is you have these four living beings on four different corners. And when they want to go this way, they don't turn their heads. They just go that way. And they're able to go with incredible swiftness. Now, as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel. And all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship. Um, workmanship being as, it, as if one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without turning as they moved. As for the rims, they were lofty and awesome, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. I don't want to meet that and try and hail that as a taxi either. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And wherever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever they, those went, they went. And wherever they stood still, these stood still. And whenever they rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. So you got the four living beings on each corner, and beside them you have wheels, and those wheels are alive. Now over the heads of the living beings, so that's the, this thing that's moving around above that. Now over the heads of the living beings there was something like an expanse, like the awesome gleam of crystal spread out over their heads. Under their expanse their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another. Each one also had two wings covering the body, uh, on the one side and on the other. I also heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the, sound, like the voice of the Almighty. A sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. And there came a voice from the expanse that was over their heads. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. Now above the expanse that was over their heads, there was something resembling a throne, like lapis lazuli, just so you know, that's sort of like, kind of like a really thick, beautiful marble, but blue, with sprinklings and flecks of gold in it. That's what this is, okay? And on that, which resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. Whoever this is, it looks like a man. Well, it has, it has humanoid features, but let's go on. Then I noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. So from the belt up, that's what it looked like. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like fire, and there was a radiance all around him. And the appearance of the rainbow and the clouds on a rainy day, so that was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So all of this is connected to something about the glory of the Lord. Okay, so question, could this be God the Father? I'm seeing some people go like this. I'm some, some people, when I look at them, they keep their neck really, because I'm not going to move one way or the other, because I'm not, I'm not going to get caught on this. Um, has any man seen God the Father at any time? No. But somehow this is connected with the glory of God. Let's read on. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. So this human-like figure begins to talk. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, that I may speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speak to me. Then he said to me, 
Son of man, I am sending you to the house of Israel to a rebellious people who were rebelled against who? Me. Well, it does sound like God. And if you thought that, you'd be right. But this is the second person in the Trinity. This is a pre-incarnate Jesus. This is a pre-incarnate Son of God before he took on flesh. Before he took on flesh, he had humanesque um, dimensions and qualities. So he said, they've rebelled against me. They and their fathers have tr transgressed against me to this very day. I am sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate, and you shall say to them, thus says the what? Lord God. I'm going to tell them, I'm, I'm going to say this to you, and you take to them and say, here's who said that. The Lord God. As for them, they are, whether they will listen or not, for they are rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So what is this? It's a mobile throne that moves around really quick. And there's somebody who's sitting on the throne, and it's a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Well, it is absolutely awe-inspiring. And the date of this, 10 years before the utter destruction of Jerusalem that happens and that was prophesied to happen. So this is 10 years before the utter destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. Ezekiel has been taken to Babylon together with Daniel, and the city had been defeated, but the temple's still standing and still has walls around it, and it's still one of the most beautiful buildings on the planet being built by Solomon 350 years earlier. But because it was so awe-inspiring and because it was so closely connected to the reputation and the glory of God, the leaders there think that God will never permit anything to happen to the temple or to them. He can't afford to. The idolatry that was going on in the countryside has now moved into the temple. And so this book called Ezekiel. Well, talk about the commissioning of Ezekiel, chapter 2 and chapter 3. The siege of Jerusalem is predicted, chapter 4. Its des desolation, desolation is predicted, chapter 5. In fact, run to chapter 5. I said it was a short course. Verse 13, thus my anger will be spent and I will satisfy my wrath on them and I will be appeased then they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my wrath upon them. Moreover, I will make you a desolation and a reproach among the nations which surround you in the sight of all who pass by. And so it will be a reproach, a reviling, a warning, and an object of horror to the nations who surround you when I execute judgments against you in anger, wrath, and raging rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken. Scoot to chapter 6, verse 4, so your altars will become desolate, desolate, and your incense altars will be smashed, and I will be, make your slain fall in front of their idols. Verse 6, in your dwellings a city will become waste, and the high places will be desolate, that you also may become waste and Desolate, your idols may be broken and brought to an end, your incense altars may be cut down. On and on. Uh, let's go to verse 14. Throw it all the inhabitants, I will stretch out my hand against them and make the land more desolate. If, if this was a word you'd never heard before, tuck in, because through the book of Ezekiel, he, he, he makes that, he uses that phrase over 40 times, over 40 times. Sometimes he's saying, I'm going to make, for example, Egypt desolate, or one of the other nations, he said, I'm going to make them desolate. But the word desolate always is talking about one particular thing. In Ezekiel chapter 8, he talks about the kind of idolatry 
that is going on in the, in the place, the house, that is named after him. He said, he stretched out, verse 3, the form of a hand and caught me by the lock of my head and the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven and brought me to the visions of God to Jerusalem. So he's saying, I want you to have a look around in Jerusalem. To the entrance of the north gate in the inner court where the seat of the idol of jealousy which provokes jealousy was located. In other words, right there brought into the temple was an idol that provoked God's jealousy. God says, there isn't room enough on my temple for me and a false god. Won't permit it. I won't permit people to have that kind of confusion. And it was something that he says provokes me to jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there. In, at that moment, in the Holy of Holies, you best not poke your nose in there because in the Holy of Holies was what? The Shekinah, the glory of God was there. And so it was that the glory of God was in the Holy of Holies, but they were bringing idols into the very sanctuary. The same ones, he said, which I saw in the plain. Uh, he said, Son of man, raise your eyes now toward the north. So I raised my eyes toward the north, and behold, to the north there was the altar gate, was this idol of jealousy at the entrance. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? The great abominations which the house of Israel are committing here, so that I would be far from my sanctuary, and yet you will see still greater abominations. He brought me to the entrance of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. In other words, he was able to see in through a hole in the wall something that was being hidden, was being concealed. He said to me, Son of man, now dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall, and behold, an entrance. And he said to me, Go and see the wicked abominations that they are committing there. So I entered and looked, and behold, every form of creeping thing and beasts and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the walls all around. On the walls, they were filling the walls where the public didn't have access, where the public couldn't come in and see, they were carving on the walls idolatrous graffiti. Why? So that when they were in there behind closed doors, they could do what was on their heart and worship idols. Standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jaaz Aniah, the son of Saphan, studying, standing among them, each man with a censer in his hand, and the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what the elders of the house are committing in the dark? Each man in the room of his carved images, for they say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. He, I, we haven't seen him much. And he said to me, you will see still greater abominations which they are committing. He brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. This was part of the whole thing of another form of idolatrous worship. And he said to me, do you see this, son of man? Yet you will see still greater abominations than thee. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. This is right at the very center and behold, at the entrance of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, there were 25 men with their backs to the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were prostrating themselves toward, eastward toward the sun. They were worshiping Ra from Egypt. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? Is it too light a thing in the house of Judah to commit the abom abominations which they have committed here, that they have filled the land with violence and provoked me repeatedly? For behold, they are putting the twig to their nose. Therefore, I indeed will deal in wrath. My eye will have nor pity, nor will I spare. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not listen to them. And so he begins how that looks. Here's the first move. 
Then he cried out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Draw near, O executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. He's saying instead of protecting, he says, Okay, guys, and, and that is going to be always the case. Around the legitimate um, organizations that really do at least represent themselves as representing God, there will be enemies just itching to come and destroy. And here he's saying, okay, guys, you got a free pass. Come. Behold, six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his shattering weapon in his hand, and among them was a certain man clothed in linen with a writing case in his loins, and they went in and stood beside the bronze altar. They're taking over. Then the glory of God of Israel went up from the cherub on which it had been. So the glory of God was between the cherub on the Ark of the Covenant. That went up to the threshold of the temple, to kind of the porch, the outer porch. And he called to the man clothed in linen at whose loins was the writing case. The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in the midst. But the others, he said, in my hearing, Go through the city after him, strike, do not, do not let your eye have pity, and do not spare. What he's doing is he's saying, okay, I'm done protecting them. I'm done protecting them. And it's put in the terms of, I'm letting them go desolate. They are desolate of the protection of the wings of God. That's the first move. It's also referred to in chapter 10, verse 3. And it, and it was huge. And of course, as they were conducting the business of the temple, nobody even... That nobody even noticed that God had left. Nobody noticed. Scoot ahead to chapter 10, verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. Then the cherubim departed. They lifted their wings and rose up from the earth in my sight within the wheels beside them, and they stood still at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord of Israel hovered over them. Glory of the Lord, first move, moves out of the Holy of Holies to the porch. Second move, the glory of the Lord moves from there to basically the wall that was surrounding the temple. He's going, I don't want any part of this. The whole thing is corrupted. That's the second move. Chapter 11, verse 23. Then the cherub lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel hovered over them. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which is east of the city. I don't know how much you remember about geography. The glory of the Lord removed altogether from the temple and temple mount and went to, it says here, the, the hillside, the mountain, just east of the temple. Does anyone... Remember what that place is called? Well, we know it as the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives. And so what it's saying here is the glory of the Lord left the temple, said, my hands are of protection are off. I'm leaving it desolate. And went over to the Mount of Olives to just kind of watch and see. And so here's what happens. Here, guys is what happens when you're doing your own defending. Here is what happens when God's hand of protection has been taken off of you because of your rebellion, disobedience, and idolatry. Because you think you're invincible. God says, okay, then you defend yourselves. Takes his hand of protection off, and they are left desolate. And destruction comes. The glory of the Lord departed. If you want to say that in one word in Hebrew, you would say Ichabod. Ichabod. Kabod, glory. Ech, which is the Alpha Yod, 
is the kind of like the Greek alpha in front of it, the negator. No glory or glory departed. Glory departed. Wow. He's saying the defense, protection, and shielding is gone. All association with Jerusalem is gone, and God is withdrawing his wings of protection, provision, and guardianship, and turning Israel and also the other places Ezekiel prophesies against over to hostile forces like natural disaster and, more importantly, a free pass of the hostile enemies around them to destroy them. What's the outcome when God says, you're left desolate? I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight your fights anymore. Turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36. Verse 11, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. This is a reign under the, what you'd say, permission of the Babylonian overlords. The Babylonians have said, you're permitted to have this reign as long as you don't go against us. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not humble himself before Jeremiah the prophet who spoke for the Lord. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear allegiance by God. But he stiffened his neck, hardened his heart against turning to the Lord God of Israel. Furthermore, all the officials of the priests and the people were very unfaithful following all the abominations of the nations. And they defiled the house of the Lord which he had sanctified which he had sanctified in Jerusalem. That's what we just read about in chapter 8 of Ezekiel. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God rose against his people until there was no remedy Destruction is coming, no matter what you do now. Who did he send? Well, he sent people like Jeremiah, he sent people like Ezekiel, and they mocked him, they laughed at him. And so he says, okay, okay, I'll find a way to get your attention. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young men or virgins, old or infirm, he gave them all into his hand. Desolation. All the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasuries of the house of the Lord, and the treasuries of the king and of his officers, he brought them all to Babylon. Then they broke, pardon me, they burned the house of God, broke down the walls of Jerusalem, burned all its fortified, Uh, fortified buildings with fire and destroyed all its valuable articles. Absolutely demolished it. Scraped it level. Those who had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon and they were servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Well, that's what he means by Leave it desolate. He says, I'm no longer going to provide or even associate with them. It has been left desolate, unprotected, and it's going to be destroyed. With that in mind, let's look one more time at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Verse 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. That's why it should have chilled their blood. This has happened before, and that's what it meant, and that's what happened. 
behold, your house is being left to you desolate. It's being left desolate. Let's scoot ahead for a moment to chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. Hey, have a look at the temple. We saw that in Luke. We'll get back to that in a minute. And he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. That would have been inconceivable to these... How God will never do that to his own temple, his own place, the place that's named by his name. And he was sitting on the Mount of Olives. Oh, the same place, the same place. Here's the deal, here's what's going on. 600 years earlier, a pre-incarnate Christ sat on a mobile throne chariot on this very hillside. And when we get to heaven, we'll probably find exactly the same place, because that's how God usually runs it. The Mount of Olives. And he's looking over the temple that was called after his name, but had in fact rejected him. In the very place that was thoughtfully designed by Solomon, expressed for the worship purpose of worshiping him, these, the leaders of Israel rejected him and worshiped everything else but him, Ezekiel in Second Chronicles tells us. The leaders 600 early, years earlier had reasoned that the temple was too important to the Lord for him to let it to be destroyed, too magnificent, it's encrusted with gold. It was the very symbol of God's presence. So they reasoned God, God will tolerate a bit of disobedience. He kind of has to. He'll tolerate a bit of immorality. What's he going to do? A bit of idolatry, a bit of unfaithfulness, because God could never afford the indignity, the embarrassment, the humiliation of having this world-famous symbol of his glory and majesty harmed. The glory of the Lord was right there, Ezekiel said, in the Holy of Holies. And in their mind, he's right there, a hostage. He can't go anywhere. We can do whatever we like, because what's God going to do? He needs the building. He needs this place. He needs us. So the Lord was right there, a hostage to meekly observe whatever worship they wanted to engage in and whatever graffiti they put on the walls. God would not dare destroy his own temple and have all his beautiful things either destroyed or carted off. Well, 600 years earlier, he dared. He dared. The glory of the Lord departed Ichabod. God does not need to share the building, and he will not. God does not need to share worship with other gods, and he will not. God does not need the building. The building needs God. The building needs God. So he left it desolate. He withdrew his protection and invited the myriad of powerful enemies that always surround was connected to the name of the Lord in. And it was burned and leveled to the ground. That was his answer 600 years earlier to the graffiti on the walls and the empty use of his name. 600 years later. This is Wednesday of the Passion Week. Jesus pronounces that he's done teaching. That was my last public teaching event. I'm done. 
First step, he departs the temple. He leaves the temple. The day before he'd said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Today he says, your house. To the leaders, the wings of protection are being removed. The second person of the Trinity is leaving the temple again. The glory is departing. The leaders didn't grasp what was even happening. We find as we look at the account of, of Mark, very significantly, God leaves the temple. The Son of God leaves the temple. And then it even remarks that he pauses for a minute at the gate, the eastern gate. And he says, D do you see all this? Not just do you see the building, but do you see what's going on? The corruption, the false doctrine, my name being smudged with idolatry. Do you see that? And then the third movement. He goes and sits on a place that's very familiar to him, on the Mount of Olives. Well, he pauses there and he says, Matthew says he went back to that very place, sat, he'd sat 600 years earlier, and he says, do you see that building? Well, the disciples are still awestruck with the beauty of the building. And it would have been incredible. If you go to Luke chapter 21 again, they were, and, and looking at the building from the Mount of Olives, it would have been awe-inspiring. The... Um, some of you maybe in your homes have polished granite, uh, white polished granite on your, your countertops. Uh, that's what the rocks were. It would have been beautiful. White polished stones, some of them the size of a mobile home, one piece, were adorned with precious jewels, slabs of gold, and a golden vine with a huge golden grapes. He says this, they were talking, verse 5, about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones. In other words, they took a beautiful stone and they put a whole bunch of beautiful, precious stones on it, because just to kind of give an accent point. And votive gifts, which is, okay, I vowed them. It'd be a little along the line of, um, I, I give this as my last will and testament, you know, Billy gets something, and Al's gets something, and the rest. Put that into something that'll really look splashy on the wall of the temple. Votive gifts, they're looking at all this stuff. And he said, as for these things which you are looking at, the days will come. The days will come. It was too beautiful for God to ever let anything happen to it. It was thought to visually represent him. If anything was to happen, people would say God could not even defend his own house. And of course, we know that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. God says, come on in. Bring them in. The Romans came in. And yes, they leveled it to the ground. And somebody will say, well, whoa, 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 hang on. Isn't there something where, you know, at the, the Wailing Wall, aren't there some big stones? So there's still some stones left on another. What's going on? Those were the foundation that were under the temple. They're all made of a different kind of stone. The stones of the temple, they're gone. They're gone. Ground to powder, burned, trashed. The whole place is trashed. Exactly as he said. I could read to you some of the accounts of the barbarity of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They are among the most horrific descriptions of warfare that exist in the possession of man. Josephus, for example, gives very, very vivid descriptions. If you're interested, you can look that up. But interestingly, the Word of God passes over descriptions of those days. The Word of God was still being written, and he doesn't, he doesn't give us all those details. The Word of God will never harm anyone, 
but the words of Josephus may. So I'm not going to give you those descriptions. What do we need to know? Verse 6. Not one stone will be left on another, which will not be torn down. The description of what happened at the very first fall of the Solomonic Temple were repeated 600 years later. Okay, what do we, what's our takeaway? We can make a tragic mistake today that a building is too important to God to allow for its destruction, or an organization or a church. Church is too important. God will never, like, wipe that church out. The organization is always going to be protected, and it'll never be permitted to fail and to be destroyed. But twice now, God has made it very clear the building, the city, the organization needs the approval of God. God does not need anything here on earth. People all through history have wagered that their organization or their city or today what's happening, their country is too important to the cause of God for God to really deal harshly with them or bring them to task. Every time somebody makes that wager, they lose. They lose. He warns. He endures the mocking of the warnings and the mockings of his messengers for a little while. And then he turns them over to their all too willing enemies and they learn. God did not need us. We needed God. We needed to be obedient to God. Interesting thing, as I was doing the preparation for this sermon, people were talking about what's happening, for example, to neighbors of us to the south. And they said, man, what's going on culturally? What sort of values are being taught in the schools, what sort of things are being permitted, like abortion, like gay marriage, like all of those things. And of course, what's happening here in Canada? What, what kind of thing? But, but people have been saying, yeah, it's bad. You know, it, it's, it's really bad. But, I mean, for years, these countries have been the backbone of missions. These countries have been standing for Christian principles. Yeah, things have got bad, but, but God can't afford to have the destruction of these countries because his name is involved. His, his name is, is right in the Constitution. They, he can't afford to let the enemies have a go. God needs us, is essentially what they're saying. And everybody needs to know, God doesn't need anything of us. We need Him. We need to be obedient to God. What's your opinion? How badly does God need you? given all the things that you can do for God with your paycheck, with whatever it is that you think is making you so that you are irreplaceable to God. Will, will God continue to allow and just cringe at your disobedience, your idolatry? Will he continue to put up with, oh, Lord, yeah, it's communion. Sorry about that. But you have no intention of ever changing. How long will he ever put up with that before you, your family, your organization, he just says, okay, I'm going to 
take away my wings of protection and leave you to some very willing enemies, and you will fall. You need to remember, we all need to remember, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. Careful. If this moment catches you at a time where you're realizing there's things going on in my life that I promised to repent of a long time ago, and I haven't, God says, if you continue to be that person who stiffens his neck and hardens his heart, what happens? That neck will be suddenly cut off and that without remedy. Don't do it. If he has been gracious enough to prevent, pro provide you an opportunity to repent this morning, grab it and really repent. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 23 for a moment. These are words that should have chilled their blood. Verse 38, Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. I'm gone. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me. I'm gone. Oh, wait, hang on. Until. You won't see me until. Oh, sorry about that, guys. We only got part of the way through that verse, and actually we only got part of the way through Ezekiel. There's more to the story coming. Come on back next week, and we'll look at that. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord that you are so predictable and you will not compromise your holiness. Help us, Lord, to stand in fear and to be those who are quick to repent, easy and quick repenters, knowing, Lord, that you don't need us. We need you. And then, Lord, we thank you for the remainder of the message you are able to make your people stand. You are able to have it so that not one hair of their head will be harmed. You're able to bring them to glory for your namesake if they are genuinely yours. I would pray today that if there's some here today who realize that they have been banking on the forbearance and the tolerance of God, that they would reject that, knowing that the axe could fall any time. Help them to respond, help them to re repent, and walk in obedience. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that we were given this chance this morning, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Call on our worship leaders.